Welcome to Comics Crash Course. This week continues our discussion of visual rhetoric with an examination of color. So we determine individual colors based on the ways that our eyes perceive different wavelengths of the visible light spectrum. So this means that colors are simultaneously based on real physical phenomenon, uh, but also due to the slight differences of individual cones and rods in each of our eyes, that our experience of color is very personal and subjective. In other words, we may all see something blue, but your blue might not look exactly like my blue. And on top of that, well, colors are connected to emotional and even physical experiences. And that becomes a chicken and egg conundrum. Do these colors elicit these feelings because of long-held associations different cultures have with certain colors? Or do those long-held associations spring from physical responses? Uh, yeah. I threw culture in the mix, because it's not all science either. In the US, we associate blue with sadness, uh, to the extent that we say, I'm feeling blue if we're feeling sad, for example. <laughs> but there's no literal or physical reason for sadness to be blue. Tears are clear, and our faces and eyes turn red when we cry, and rainy skies, which are usually associated with sadness, well, they're gray. And actually blue things, like a clear sky or the ocean and a tropical beach are pretty nice. And yet, when we're sad, we're blue. <sighs> Who knows? So not only does it not have a necessarily physical component, but again, cultural specificity. For example, in Japan, like in many Western cultures, white is associated with purity. However, in Japan, white also happens to be the color of mourning, as opposed to Western cultures where we associate mourning with black. But then there's post-apartheid South Africa in which uh, the color red has come to be associated with mourning uh, as well as for the struggle for equality. But then red symbolizes good luck in East Asia, especially China and Japan. For example, as you can see in the stock photo from the Japanese stock market exchange, red is used in both China and Japan to indicate a rising stock market. Well, in US, because it's usually used for things like stop signs, it's used to indicate a failing stock. So, color is complicated, and its effects, while huge, can change from person to person. There are three aspects of each individual color for you to consider. First is its hue, that is, the color itself. Is it red, blue, yellow, etc.? Once you've got that down, you take note of the color's chroma. Now, this has a couple different names. I usually call it its saturation, in part because I'm familiar with that term from programs that manipulate images, like Photoshop. Essentially, chroma refers to the intensity or purity of the color, as opposed to it being kind of dull or weak. And then finally, there's value. And we'll discuss value in more depth soon because it applies to more than just color. But for now, we're referring to value as the relative lightness or darkness of a color. Anyway, you can go way deeper, but this is already turning into a crash course within a crash course, so we're going to move on for now. One thing you probably do know about color theory from elementary or middle school, if you took art classes, is the color wheel, so I thought I'd mention it here. Uh, what the color wheel does is help us understand the primary colors, which are red, yellow, and blue, and the secondary colors, which are created by mixing primary colors together, green, purple, and orange. The wheel is a tool to help us understand the relationships of these colors to each other. Uh, for example, we can see how secondary and primary colors are related to each other as they fade into uh, each of the colors around the wheel. Another tool is the notion of complementary colors um, that comes from the wheel. So colors on the opposite side of the wheel are complementary, um, with an E and not an I in the middle there. So this means colors like red and green, purple and yellow, blue and orange, they make a high impact pairing to the eye, like black and white, and they're often good pairs for design because this high contrast between them, the fact that they're on opposite ends, leads to a greater harmony. So another important notion that comes with color theory uh, and that will come up when you hear people discuss the nature of colors in a piece of art is the concept of warm or cool colors. So as the term suggests, warm colors are those sort of associated with daylight, uh, and particularly with um, sunrise and sunset, while well, cool colors are associated not necessarily with nighttime, um, although that is part of it, but also with a kind of cloudy or even rainy day. So warm colors tend to be your reds and your yellows, while cool colors tend to be blues and grays. However, some reds can have cool tones, and some blues can be warm, so it can get kind of tricky. 
Finally, there are what are called neutral colors. And in this context, neutral means that the color hue, saturation, and value functions almost in this case as if it doesn't have a color. So black, white, and gray are almost universally considered neutral, up to the point that a lot of folks don't even think they're colors, right? They'll look at a black and white or a black, white, and gray comic and say, well, it doesn't, it's not colored. But, well, of course they are. They're black, white, and gray. But depending on the tone and context, sometimes browns, pastels, tans, um, skin tones, those are also considered neutral colors. So, finally, we come to it. Color in comics. I discussed comics and color a little bit in episode 22, Who Makes Comics, when I discussed the role of the colorist. In brief, while color has existed in comics since the late 19th century, actually, until the 1980s, colorists were limited at most to about 64 colors due to the commercial viability of the coloring process and printing. And on top of that, the cheap paper meant that even bright colors didn't show up with the same saturation, or chroma perhaps, of the raw pigment, and so colorists had to account for that. So that's why reprints of old comics often look really, really garish, really bright and cartoony in a way that older comics just don't. So as I've been saying this, I've been showing an example of some reprinted comics from the 1960s and scans of the original comic as they are printed. It's a pretty stark difference, isn't it? And again, this gives us difference of how you're going to interpret the page. So speaking of interpretation, I think we all have a pretty intuitive sense of how color can affect our interpretation. It's why horror movies are dark and dingy, but romantic comedies are light and bright, and cozy living rooms are full of warm colors, browns and deep greens and reds, but cool modern living rooms have whites and grays and maybe a splash of teal. In the, in the USA, anyway, you wouldn't wear bright colors to a funeral, as I was talking about earlier, and it's out of the ordinary, although not entirely impossible, for folks to decorate wedding spaces with black. These colors have connotations. But does color really do more than emphasize the pre-existing meaning of comics, building on the illustration and the words that already have created the meaning? I mean, you know the answer, right? So frankly, for me, one of the clearest examples of this is Alan Moore, Brian Boland, and John Higgins' The Killing Joke. So this was first released in 1988. But there's an apocryphal story that Brian Boland was never particularly happy with Higgins, the colorist's work. He had always wanted a more muted palette. So when the 20th anniversary edition of the book came out, Boland recolored it according to his vision. And the result is, in my opinion anyway, nowhere near as effective. This is a Joker-centric story. It ends with Joker literally leading Batman to an abandoned carnival to try and convince Batman that, well, Batman is simply one bad day away from becoming the Joker. So the garish colors are part of the story. They add to the sickening, twisted, funhouse feel, especially in the end. There's nothing wrong with Boland's work. It's technically fine. In fact, it's quite well done. But there's something dull and lifeless about it. I mean, why so serious? The thing I like about this example is that it's literally the same lines, the same script, the same page layout, and the only thing that changes is the color. But man, what a change. Another example of this shift is when longtime black and white comics are colored. For example, Scholastic picked up Bone to reprint it for youth audiences, which is great, and at that point they decided to color it. It's a beautiful job, but it's strange for longtime readers like me to see it colored. In a strange way, it looks more cartoony? I can't put my finger on why, but there you go. Or there's Akira. Before the manga boom, Marvel had the rights to translate and publish this manga in the wake of the popular 1988 movie. They figured a black and white comic wasn't going to sell well because, it, I mean, it really wasn't an indie book. They were trying to sell it with, you know, the Marvel name attached, technically through a journal called Epic. They got permission from the author, Otomo Katsuhiro, to color the art. Now, I've only ever been exposed to the later Dark Horse reprints, which returned to the original black and white. But there was a whole generation of Akira fans who were first exposed to the comic as a color comic. The long and short of it is, just like the Killing Joke example above, there are different experiences here, and they are just that, different experiences. So it's reasonable to assume that readers of texts with different coloring come to different interpretations of the text. I mean, sometimes it might be pretty subtle, but it's just as easily not. 
And I'm pushing this because colorists often get the short end of the stick. When it comes to lists of creators people mention, they tend not to make the cut, and this is true of myself as well. But a good colorist can make the difference between a powerful emotional moment and one falling flat, between a line artist's work looking sharp and readable or it looking like a jumble of lines. Color is a powerful, powerful tool, and one that affects all comics, because as I briefly mentioned before, even the so-called lack of color in black and white comics is a color choice. Anyway, next time I'll talk about how size, value, and texture are a trio of elements that work together because artists manipulate a two-dimensional plane to create illusions. Find out more next time. See you then. I hope you've been enjoying Comics Crash Course. If you'd like to help us out, I encourage you to click like, to tell your friends to check out our channel, and as always, to hit subscribe.